When people do these end of the year roundup, countdown, bird up, hoe down, uh, review things, they always say stuff like 2022 was the year of conflict because in games you fought the bad guy people and also geopolitical event that also happened this year. It always feels so weird and contrived to me because time doesn't really feel that linear. Remember when Elden Ring came out? That was in February, about 10 months ago, right? Get this, Queen Elizabeth's death? That was actually in 2016, isn't that crazy? Almost three years ago. Believe it or not, I have actually played some video games in these last 365 calendar days. Some of them were worth talking about. Some of them were even released this very year. So here's the ones that I played that I want to talk about in descending numeric order. Yes, it's a very original format, but before we get to the epic gamer top 10, I quickly want to talk about a couple of other games first. Call them honorable mentions if you want, I guess. Let me tell you something about me and MMOs. I've played a few of them in my time. Path of Exile, Terra, Neverwinter, the one that shall not be named. The only MMO I've ever stuck to for longer than a month was Pirates Online, and uh, that game sucks. So when I gave Lost Ark a shot, I was also giving the entire genre of MMORPGs another chance. I mean, this game was the chosen one. Everybody and their mother was there for the global release. Servers were so packed that wait times approached DMV numbers, and I was there. I waited, I played. 20 hours during the launch week back in February. And in the 10 months since then, 9 hours. Yeah, despite the crispy animations and sounds, despite the endless content to play, despite all the Twitch Prime bundles and login rewards that they could throw at me, I still have absolutely no desire to play Lost Ark. And maybe it's the combat systems, maybe it's just the way that MMOs are structured, but the only thing I've ever felt while playing them is this, like, hollow monotony. Building your character and finding combos gets some engagement out of me, but it feels like being good at an MMO is about 20% skill, 70% grinding, and about 10% reading forum posts. I guess you're there for a long time, not a good time. And not that I think Lost Ark is a bad time, it's probably one of the better MMOs I've played, but I'd still rather play like, I don't know, real fishing again before this. I don't mean to start this Subway-sponsored celebration of games. What the does that even mean, by the way? Celebration of games. I didn't mean to start this by dropping a giant deuce on one of the biggest releases of the year. It's still one of the most popular games on Steam, and I assume there's a reason for that. I just wanted to include this here so that in the future, if you ever wonder whether or not I'm playing the hot new MMO on the scene, uh, you don't really have to ask. The answer is almost certainly no. So I've been playing Breath of the Wild on and off for the past few months, and I've got to say, I've been really impressed with the time I've spent so far. I was going to try to finish it in October, but then I got really into Vampire Survivors, and then I was going to finish it in November, but then I got back into Warframe, and then I was going to finish it in December, but then I realized, oh shit, I should probably stream more than once a week, and then I realized, oh shit, I should probably be uploading more than once every three months, and... Then I realized, well, you get the idea. So I've only played about 15 hours of Breath of the Wild, and while I obviously can't speak to the whole quality of the game, because I haven't seen all of it, I can't imagine the gameplay loop will change too much before I get to polishing off the remaining 50 hours. You can't seriously expect me to put that much time into it. Okay, well actually, now that I think about it, I mean, in all seriousness, I am looking forward to finishing this game. I really like how your abilities interface both with combat and puzzles pretty seamlessly in the same way. And being able to knock things around with physics has never been a bad feature in any game. The art style and visuals are really great too, but I mean, that's not really news to anyone, is it? Those of you with keen gamer eyes may have noticed that this footage is recorded at 60 FPS, but this game is locked to 30 FPS on the Switch and the Wii U. Isn't that weird? Okay, I'm gonna move on now before Nintendo has me unceremoniously bombed. And how about only games that I've actually finished from now on, eh? In the first of our dialogue-focused indie games set in despondent rural America, Night in the Woods. I know this game also came out in 2017, but come on, I wasn't even born back then. This is a quaint little game featuring quaint little characters with quaint little problems. Problems like stagnation, lack of direction, a chronic and nauseating feeling of existential dread. In general, I'd say this game is very relatable. Not relatable in the way that you watch Spider-Man take a driving test in a car commercial and go, wow, he's just like me for real for real. No, like, relatable in the sense that May, along with the rest of the cast of this game, genuinely feel and act like normal people going about their daily lives. What's especially authentic to me is the way characters talk to each other. People don't really speak 
script. They speak word stuff. Their trains of thought get derailed. They stop and start and go um and use the word and too many times. It probably sounds easy enough to just slap a few pauses and ums into a sentence and that sort of emulates that a person is thinking as they're talking, but you really have to do it with intent and purpose to convey more than what's just being said. And that's especially important for a game like this where you don't have much animation or face modeling going on to express emotions outside of that. Although I gotta say, the eyes in this game are very, very well done. Little details like that are everything in a game that's essentially talking with the occasional minigame. The minigames themselves are kind of a mixed bag for me. The rhythm game in particular didn't feel that good, and it's weird how they chose to give the songs lyrics in spite of the lack of voices. I'm gonna try to hold my comparisons to Kentucky Route Zero until later, but I will say that I do prefer the way that music was used in that game to this one. I would be remiss not to talk about the art style, which, as you can see, is clean, polished, very nicely colored. The characters all have very distinct and memorable designs, which definitely helps when you're getting acquainted with the local residents. The backgrounds also have a really nice range between flat indoor areas and distant hazy hills. It's very artfully done. I would say the art and designs are probably the highlight of this game, and they complement the humdrum happenings of an American small town surprisingly well. The dream sequences are pretty too, but I'm still not really sure what purpose they serve. Stress dreams are often weird and nonsensical like any other dreams, but there's this sort of continuous mythos running through the dreams. I guess it's open to interpretation. After doing some reading and watching some videos, I haven't seen much of a consensus beyond the obvious, which is their stress dreams. I don't know, maybe you'll find more meaning in them than I did. Overall, I think Night in the Woods is a nice game that tells a good enough story. It didn't blow me away or anything. When I finished it, I basically just thought, yeah, okay. I do recommend it, though. I had quite a bit of fun running around the town and getting to know all the people, but it might be some time before I play it again. There's still a surprising amount of discussion going on about Prey 2017. Is it the greatest immersive sim ever made? Is it just okay? What would happen if one of those big blobs pinned you up against a wall and had its way with you? I think immersive sims live and die by their environment, and in that respect, Prey does not disappoint. I know everybody said this five years ago or whatever, but a giant space station like this is really perfect for this kind of game. You could basically lay things out however you want if you're the level designer. I mean, it's a future science lab space station, just put things in places, I don't know. That design freedom lets you give the player freedom in how they approach things, and that's what immersive sims are all about, right? Then all you have to do is give the player a big set of abilities and let them loose. The game does just that, but then it also tells you maybe don't invest in all of the abilities, because then the station will be hostile to you. I guess in theory this is supposed to encourage you to be selective with your upgrade choices, but in my experience I barely used the Typhon abilities at all. I basically glue gunned and grenaded my way through the entire game, and while I guess that isn't inherently wrong, I'm not sure that that's what I was intended to do. I mean, I suppose playing in an unintended way is basically an eventuality in any immersive sim, but it does feel like the combat formula has some solutions that work a little too well too often. The writing generally ranges from decent to quite good. The main questline does a really great job of moving you along without feeling like you're being dragged for too long. The side quests were generally okay, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go on a spoiler-filled rant here. Uh, here's a timestamp you can skip to. Alright, you have until the count of five to skip ahead if you want to. Five, four, three, two, uh, now. Okay, so you're making an immersive sim, and you want the choices the player makes throughout the game to matter. Cool. Awesome. How do you do that? Well, there's obviously a few ways to go about it. You can make the stakes clear, you can frame and contextualize the choices with the world and its characters, and you can let the player see the results of their choices firsthand after they make them. Prey does all of this, and even does it admirably well, on the small scale, but on the larger scale, Prey does something that really annoys me. It gives you choices to abandon or help certain people, lays out the consequences for doing so, and then, at the end of the game, long after you've made these choices, completely changes the context and the significance those choices had. You see, these people you help or let die, they're not actually real. You're not even playing as the real Morgan and Morgan and Morgan, Morgan and Morgan. You're an alien in a simulation. These are simulated memories of people, and this whole thing is actually an evaluation to determine, uh, 
Well, actually, I'm not. I'm not actually sure. I guess it's to see if the Typhon aliens can be given a human understanding of empathy. But I don't really see what what is the measure of success there. It doesn't even seem like the science team knows. There's this implication that if the experiment succeeds, whatever that means, that it'll help save humanity, maybe somehow. I don't know. It's not a terrible premise on its own, but. When you retroactively reframe all these decisions as a part of this evaluation thing, it dismisses a lot of the reasons that you might have had to make your decisions in the first place. See, whether or not I help a character in a game isn't just based on whether or not I think they deserve to live or die. Here's an example from the game. Dr. Igwe is a scientist trapped in a box. A scientist on a station conducting dangerous and ethically questionable experiments dangerous and ethically questionable experiments which have gone horrifically wrong under the supervision of your brother's company, which you, Morgan Yu, are the vice president of. There are so many unknowns in this equation, is it really that unreasonable to just space him to be safe? And now for the record, that's not what happened in my playthrough. I spaced him because I thought it would be funny, but that's just the thing, isn't it? We can't really know what its motives were for anything it did. He's right, you really can't. So why are we putting on this charade in the first place? The only way you can fail this examination is if you let literally everyone die. Beyond that, the ending choice the game gives you is exactly the same no matter what. And this isn't the only game that has this kind of problem, by the way. I would really appreciate it if games would stop doing this. Oh, the timestamp is coming up. Oh, hey, uh, you want to see something funny? Check this out. <clears throat> And that's why I think Maroon 5 are just a better band than the Beatles. Anyway, I still think Prey is a good game in spite of my long-winded complaints about that. The majority of this game, which is navigating the station, working around and through enemies, is really good. Even though I didn't use much of the Typhon abilities, I still felt like there were an ample amount of angles and approaches to take on most obstacles. Again, moving objects around with physics has never been a bad feature. And even the hacking minigame was surprisingly inoffensive. I still need to try the Moon Crash DLC at some point because everybody really raves about that, but I don't know, I might play Deathloop first. We'll see. Have you ever wanted to grow your own car-centric pavement hellscape like a Chia pet? Does looking down on people like ants make you feel superior? Do you like to relax and lose your mind at the same time? Then boy, do I have a game for you. It's called Mini Motorways, and it's really much more simple than it looks. All you have to do is connect the cars with where they want to go. Red to red, blue to blue, orange to orange, purple to purple, beige to beige, darker orange to darker orange. Oh, oh god, oh dear god. You know, if this game had a realistic art style and accurate city ambience, it would make me want to rip my hair out. Instead though, my eyes and ears are graced by clean, flat colors and the most satisfying little analog synth sounds to serenade me into a false sense of security. Meanwhile, my brain is stuck trying to both min-max my road resources and prevent traffic gridlock. Turning these little strips of streets into giant webs of mayhem is really satisfying in a weird way, and it makes it all the more tough when your structures start jamming under the weight of all the traffic. One thing that's especially important in games like this is working out any rough spots in the controls and UI. Basically, the entire game is you placing down roads, so if even one part of that process is janky, the entire play experience could be ruined. I was a bit worried about that given that this game was designed for both mobile and desktop, but for the most part everything is very smooth. The only slight exception is motorways being a bit finicky about where they can be placed, but once you get the hang of things, the map really becomes your canvas. Actually, that's a bad metaphor. I've never seen someone try to paint on a canvas that's actively fighting against them by placing random spots all over the place. Like, who gave you a permit to build here? I'm not a big fan of most of the zoning practices we have here in North America, but oh boy does this game give me an appreciation for the general idea of zoning. If anybody ever tells you there should be no rules regarding where you can and can't build a house, just sit them down in front of this game and then make them watch some Not Just Bikes videos or something so they don't think that car-centric infrastructure is the solution to everything. If this game looks like your vibe, it's probably worth the 10 bucks. There's also Mini Metro, which was the studio's first game, but that's still in my landfill of a backlog. I'll, I'll get to it at some point. All right, now that we've got those games out of the way, we can finally get to the good stuff. Real fishing for the PlayStation 1. Okay, I know this looks like a joke, and it is a joke, but I actually do really like this game. It's a simple fishing game with not a lot of content, but something about the FMV backgrounds combined with this soundtrack? 
It's like Sega Bass Fishing's chill older brother, where that game has a guy frantically yelling at you to lower the rod every three seconds. Real fishing just has this photo of an ambiguous father-like figure. When you find the breaking point, it's easy to drop your lure into the slack water near the bottom. Uh, by the way, if anybody happens to know who this guy is, please let me know. The credits acknowledge a Mark Davis as pro angler, but I don't think this is our guy. While there was apparently a kajillion sequels to this game, the most recent of which is a visual novel from 2019 that maybe 10 people own, the original is a PlayStation 1 exclusive, so unless you want to buy a disc copy of a game that released 26 years ago, which you could do, I just recommend uh, ethically and legally sourcing a ROM. Okay, now we can go on to the top 10. When a game comes swinging out of the gate with role-playing in the ruins of interplanetary capitalism, there's certainly some big expectations being set. And while I think everybody's initial impression of this game is, gee, where have I seen this before? I think Citizen Sleeper does enough on its own to be more than Disco Elysium, but in space. It's dice system, for one. Instead of rolling for success or failure as you're trying to do something, you pre-roll all of your dice at the beginning of the day, then you can choose what you want to try and what role you want to use on it. There's variety in the risk and rewards, too, and taking up different activities can lead you into new characters and quest lines. Combine that with some basic skill trees, and you've got yourself a pretty simple but robust little RPG system. I'd say the writing overall is quite good, lots of purposeful and memorable sequences no matter which endings you eventually navigate towards. I will admit I was pretty skeptical that this game would have anything new to bring to the table given how much cyberpunk stuff has come out in the last 30 years, and the setting of a poor and remote space station isn't exactly the most original backdrop, but I was pleasantly surprised to see how tasteful and even reserved this game can be, even though you play as an escapee, contractual robo-slave. Just about everyone you meet is trying to just scrape together money in some way or another, but rather than just point directly at that and say, just see, capitalism bad because work and poverty, it takes the time to really show you the various demands and ramifications that living in these conditions creates. Working in ship salvage, for example, comes with a very different set of problems than corporate IT, but you can see how they manifest from essentially the same place. One thing I will say, though, is while you're free to engage with most of these characters at your own leisure, that also means that the overall narrative of the game isn't as cohesive and strong as it could be. To some degree, that freedom lets you shape your own timeline of events, which is cool, and I think the game's writing tries to be cautiously aware of that where possible. But at some point, you're bound to feel like you're just jumping between things, rather than all of your choices adding up to one greater story. There definitely is a greater story at play here, and a personal one at that, but sometimes it can feel like you're just sliding a few individual things forward inch by inch. While I generally like this game's style, the art for the character portraits seem a bit odd to me in the way they contrast with how the station is rendered. The character portraits are these detailed drawings with scratches and blemishes and a million tools strapped to them, but the station is this big 3D ring of smoothed metal and bright rectangles. I don't think either of those design choices are bad, but I don't think the way they contrast really adds anything, either. I don't know, small beans, I guess. The soundtrack is made up of synth progressions, atmospheric drones, and piano, with the occasional drums there for good measure. It's not bad, but a lot of the tracks do kind of blend together for me. I was surprised to see that there are 23 tracks listed in the OST because it really felt more like 10, but again, they're fine. One interesting thing these devs are doing is releasing free episodic content post-release. I've yet to play it, so I don't know how well it connects to the main story, but I think the fact that they're even doing this for a single-player story-driven game that isn't even early access is pretty cool. You don't see that every day. So if you're the reading dice roller type and you don't mind the lack of voice acting, I think Citizen Sleeper is a pretty good shout. I wouldn't call it a masterpiece, but I think it does a great job of drawing you in and giving you reasons to keep going forward, especially if this is your aesthetic. I've been praying at my occult altar for the return of FMV games for a while now, but little did I know, Sam Barlow started bringing them back in 2015. Her story is a fascinating game. 
If you're the type of person who likes true crime, specifically those videos of detectives interrogating suspects, you have to play this game, or at the very least watch a playthrough of it, might I recommend mine. If you're not familiar with how the game works, you're given an archive of police interviews with someone related to a case, and it's your job to sift through them to figure out what happened. To do that, you search through the transcripts. There's no hard set path or restrictions that I'm aware of. Theoretically, you could crack the case in like 10 minutes if you knew exactly what to search for. But for me and most people, it takes about three to four hours on average. I'm going to be very careful about spoilers here because it's obviously best to go in as blind as possible to this kind of game. But I was really invested in getting to the bottom of it all. In addition to trying to put together a timeline of events for the crime in question, you also have to consider the timeline of these recordings themselves. It's a long process with a lot of second guessing and double checking yourself, but I think it's well worth it. Even though the nature of the evidence means that there's still a few questions technically left unanswered by the end, I was really entertained with the way things unraveled. There was a great balance of moments where I was both satisfied by confirming my theories and other moments where I was genuinely shocked. That's really hard to nail in a mystery like this, especially with such a loose structure. I have to wonder how much of my positive experience came down to me searching the right words at the right moments. I can totally see why this game won Best Narrative back in 2015, and also why Viva Safer won Best Performance. For the role she plays in this game, which is the only acted role, she had to be excellent and she was. Again, I don't want to reveal too much for people who haven't played, but the way she's internalized her posture and mannerisms is really impressive. This character has a lot of nuance and subtle detail that you really start to appreciate as you stare at footage of her for hours. I regret not taking notes while playing. In fact, I wish there was a way to do that in the game. There were times where I was stumped and didn't know what else to search for, and I think if I'd written things down I could at least have jumping off points. Sometimes I'd think up a couple of search terms and then get completely derailed by a new piece of information. And I get the feeling that's not just a me problem. But yeah, this is a very nice little game. For 10 bucks, it's certainly not bad, but you can also find it on sale for like $2.50. The game only took me about 4 hours to 100%, but $2.50, that's, that's like 10 gumballs or a third of a movie ticket. And I'd definitely rather play this than eat 10 gumballs or go to a movie theater. On the dock? That's a fish moment. Okay, I'll try to make this one quick since it's a remake but with new stuff. The Stanley Parable is one of my favorite games. Not the original Stanley Parable, the, the original remake. Not this remake of the original remake, but the original remake. That might seem odd coming from me given how I like to joke about subverting player expectations. But I think the Stanley Parable is a great example of how to do that without turning into M. Night Shyamalan. It's a game full of weird and unexpected things with lots of interesting answers and non-answers for why all these weird things happen. I think Davey Reedon originally described the impetus of this game as just being to mess with the player, and that makes sense. Even if you don't think twice about the various meta-narratives or the game telling you to die in real life in Minecraft in real life, it's fun seeing the absurd lengths the game is willing to go in service of playing with your head. If you haven't played or seen The Stanley Parable before, the Ultra Deluxe is a no-brainer even without the new content. As far as said new content goes, it's kind of a mixed bag. The spirit of just f with the player is still alive and well, but the phrase painting yourself into a corner kind of comes to mind. The new content is very upfront about being tacked on, and while I can kind of get behind that approach perfectly fine, I feel like the way it played out could have gone farther off the deep end. My favorite parts of the Stanley Parable are when the game collapses in on itself, literally and otherwise. Despite the routes and endings being separated, mostly, the way that they all center around your ability to make choices makes them feel greater than the sum of their parts. Playing the original endings felt like the game was opening my breaker box and just crossing a bunch of wires and then closing it again. And it worked, somehow. The new Ultra Deluxe stuff also does that, but not quite to the same extent that the original writing did. And don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed my time with it, but I'm not sure how much of a lasting impression it's going to leave me beyond having some funny jokes. The jokes are pretty funny, and the narrator still makes this game. Kevin Briding's performance is just as sharp here as it was back in 2013, and having him bicker and argue and antagonize you will always be at least a little entertaining to me, so 
I can give the Stanley pair of Ultra Deluxe a good thumbs up. One thing that's always kind of bugged me about reviews is that so many words get wasted on just describing what's plainly in front of you, especially when talking about writing. I've seen way too many reviews and even video essays that are supposed to be about a specific topic that just sound like, you play as this guy, and then this happens, and this happens, and look at that. That's symbolism, isn't that crazy? Symbolism in a video game. And that's why this is the best game ever made. But as annoying as I find that to be, I really wish I had the power to just sum up Kentucky Route Zero, because this game is a bastard to describe. I guess I can start by warning you that it's an indie game with a capital I. Even among the various dialogue-focused point and clicks out there, there's a lot of weird and unorthodox storytelling stuff going on, and this game is not afraid to shove you into situations that will confuse you or even just bore you to make a point. It also feels like every character you meet just has a monologue locked and loaded, ready to blast you full auto about what they did back in college, or how they got lost in a cave one time, or about two divers who ate at their restaurant once. And at the same time, these characters also host a lot of very real conversations. For better or worse, the themes and messages in this game are heavily rooted in reality, and reality does have a tendency to be confusing and boring and directionless. If I had to describe what the game is about, I'd say that it's the struggles people have trying to navigate. The initial hook is that your character is trying to make a delivery to an address that he can't find, and the motley crew that you assemble over the course of the game are people basically in that same position. They need to get somewhere, but they don't know where it is or how to get there. The story that follows isn't a traditional story, it's kind of just what happens when people are lost. They meander, they go astray, they get confused, they become skeletons. For a game that's so obtuse with its presentation sometimes, it surprises me how on the nose it can be, though it makes sense. Big corporations hold a lot of power over people's lives. That's not a hot take or a new perspective, that's just a part of reality. It's easy to recognize it when you see it, so I appreciate how the game doesn't try to frame it as some giga IQ realization. That's not to say that the game isn't subtle, the game is perfectly capable of being subtle, even cryptic at times. But there's a weird kind of straightforwardness to the way its dialogue is written that's sometimes endearing and sometimes grating. You know how in dialogue-focused RPGs they'll occasionally do that thing where they let the player decide their backstory retroactively during the game? It's a nice trick because if you try to include that in character creation, then you get like Mass Effect backgrounds that come up once in a while, but not that often. So when it does come up, it's just like, what, what, who is this? Oh yeah, right, I picked, that's right. But if you work that choice into the dialogue itself, it lets you be a lot more smooth with it. Like, no, Ulysses, you baby back bitch, I was never a Legion spy. Now, like all narrative tools, if you overuse them, things can get kind of muddy. So naturally, Kentucky Route Zero fills the entire game with this stuff. But it also isn't really a role-playing game, so it serves a very different purpose. Instead of character building or role-playing, here you have a much more direct influence on the story itself. Maybe not the events and path of the story, but the context your choices are made in. It makes your choices feel a lot more meaningful because instead of the characters' relationships being dictated to you, you kind of feel them out and map them out yourself. I know this all sounds really vague and confusing if you've never played it, but that's really the best way I can think of to describe it. There's plenty of hour-long videos you could watch that describe it better than I can, but I don't have that kind of time, so... I think Kentucky Route Zero is one of the most emotionally malleable games I've played. There is a lot to interpret, to understand, and to relate to, but the game is not going to tell you how to do any of that. That's up to you. If that sounds like lazy writing and a stupid idea to you, you probably won't like this game. If that sounds interesting to you, you might like it. Personally, well, I think it has a lot of charm to it. I enjoyed a lot of the ways that it played with narrative, but there were a few segments where I got sort of annoyed because it wasn't clear what I was supposed to do to move things forward, even though there was clearly one thing that I was supposed to be doing. Hey, isn't that just like how the characters in the game don't know how to move forward and get lost? No, it's not. What I'm talking about is like trying to plug in a USB cable and having to rotate it three times. You'll get it eventually, but you don't really learn anything by doing so. 
Okay, maybe that analogy doesn't really make sense, so I'll, I'll word it like this. The game has a lot of neat and novel tricks, but sometimes they can feel more like hurdles than steps. There. Put, put that in your Polygon article and smoke it. <laughs> I don't know. In the end, I'm surprised how much of this game stuck with me. I can't say that I particularly loved any of the characters, but it's been six months since I played this game, and I still remember most of them pretty well. There are lots of games out there that'll serve you some basic observation about the world and say, oh, well, what do you think about this, huh? Doesn't this make you think? But Kentucky Route Zero is one of the few games I've ever played that feels like the polar opposite, and I think that's why it draws me in so much. It's not trying to tell you how things are, it kind of just is. Of the negative Steam reviews that I read, a lot of them said things along the lines of, oh, it's not for me, but you should try it, which I think is a good sign. I myself didn't even realize how much this game stuck with me until I sat down to compose this list. It feels weird saying that and putting this game in the number 7 spot above other games that I gave more universal recommendations to, but it's such a weird and unique thing. You know how people describe a story as unfolding? This game folds. It folds a lot. I like it. Okay, you already know that Hades is good, it's not a secret. The combat's zippy and responsive, the art is amazing, the soundtrack's full of bangers, the characters are endearing without being overbearing, and you could pet a Cerberus. If that isn't enough to sell you on this game, I don't know what else to tell you. It's great. So why is it number 6 on this list and not higher? Well, I mean, the competition is getting pretty stiff here. I mean, this is number 6 out of the top 15 games of the 35 to 40 or so that I played this year. But still, I, I do have a few minor grievances. Although the first thing I want to say isn't even a grievance, really, it's just a taste thing. I don't care for Greek mythology whatsoever. I feel like I've been having it forced on me since childhood. Movies, books, plays. My sixth grade class put on a musical version of Theseus and the Minotaur. I had to read excerpts from the Iliad in high school, and, and yes, I get it. It's very iconic, very influential stuff. Where the fuck was 1001 Nights? Beowulf? I'm sure there's some interesting choices and attention to detail in how Hades portrays these various gods and myths, but I've been fatigued on Greek mythos for at least 10 years at this point, and that's obviously not the game's fault, but that's, you know, part of the reason why it's here at number 6. One grievance that I do have that's actually a little more valid regards the various combat animations. They're pretty and generally nice, but when the pace is picking up, the screen can feel a little visually cluttered. It's not an issue every run, but when it is, it can lead to some frustrating and preventable points of damage. And I really need all the help I can get given how often I dash on the traps. I think the way this game handles the god's abilities is a really nice step for roguelikes. Letting you not only choose between a god's various abilities, but also between the gods themselves is a great way of introducing more player choice while not just letting you grab everything you want. It goes without saying that putting a good build together is very satisfying too. I'm really looking forward to see what Supergiant do with Hades 2. This is the first sequel they've ever done, so I can only assume they've either got some nice ideas or they really just want to rake in that money since Hades is their best-selling title by a decent margin. I have faith either way. This is easily my favorite game from them so far, and they've got a pretty good record in general, by my account. You know that Jay Sawyer mod for New Vegas? Turns out, that mod? Actually named after a real guy, and his last name? Not even Ultimate Edition, what the hell? Apparently he's been trying to get something like this off the ground for about 20 years, and once Obsidian became an Xbox studio, I guess there was finally enough green around to give Pentiment a green light. At a surface level glance, I kinda expected this to be a game that would only appeal to a very specific audience. After playing it, I'd probably still say that, but I think the potential net for this game is much wider than it looks. Yes, it's a dialogue-centric adventure game set in feudal Bavaria. It's a lot of reading with no voice acting outside of the accessibility text-to-speech. I know that description by itself is going to make a lot of heads turn the other way, and I'll be honest, if it wasn't on Game Pass, and if a month of Game Pass wasn't a dollar, I might have never got around to playing this game. But man, I'm really glad that I did. When you talk about a setting for a story, especially one that's designed to be historically accurate, the question at hand is always, why? Why tell your story in this particular place at this particular time? You don't need to justify every grain of sand with a Bible chapter, but I think things should broadly make sense. For example, if you want to tell the story of an outlaw cowboy desperately trying to escape his past, setting it during the death of the American frontier is very appropriate. 
Pentamith setting, the village of Tassing, is incredibly faithful. Not to a specific real town, Tassing and all of its characters are fictional, but faithful to something much greater. For some people, that's God, some others, it's their families, and then there's our boy Andreas. Andreas isn't sure what his truest purpose is, but as a wise man once said, things are constantly happening. Somebody is killed at the local monastery, and so begins a long series of cascading events that change the lives of the townspeople for years. Like, 20 years. In addition to the story at hand, this game chronicles the lives of people. Farmers, workers, mothers and fathers and sons and daughters. You see all these people change over time. And I know that sounds kind of like some pie-in-the-sky, infinite quests type of promise, but it's done very genuinely and meticulously on a small scale in this little villa. I don't think any other game has ever made me feel so conscious about the past and the future. This game didn't just pick medieval Bavaria so it could have a cool art style or soundtrack, though it does have both of those things as well. It chose this setting to give us a window into the lives of people who we've only ever seen as drawings and text. Not videos or pictures where we can accurately see things as they really were, but interpretations and retellings. That's the underlying current that I think makes this game special. As far as the plot itself, it's good. I've seen a lot of discussion about the third act since it changes the pace of the game a fair bit, and while I've certainly felt that speed bump, I knew it had to be going somewhere, so I had patience for it. There's not really much more I can say without spoiling things, so I'll wrap this up by saying if you have Game Pass or you're at all interested in Pentiment, I highly recommend it. It's reading, yes, but it's purposeful, and it'll definitely show you some things that you've never seen before. I think I'll give it one or two more playthroughs before I tell you that it's a certified hood classic, but it's really good. What some of you may not know is that despite my long and abusive relationship with Counter-Strike, I also have quite a fondness for movement boomer shooters. I know at least one of you just tabbed back into this window because you think I'm about to talk about Ultra Kill, but that game's not out of early access, silly. It can't be on this list. You know what could be, though? Dusk. I've been thinking for a long while about how much I'd enjoy a single-player campaign with Quake's classic momentum-based movement and modern Doom's level design insights, but after playing Dusk, I'm not actually sure if that could top this. What really does it for me is the change-ups between larger open areas where you can kind of freestyle on enemies as they spawn in, and the more cramped sections that connect them. Not only is this game wise enough to take advantage of the different gameplay opportunities that these different environments give you, it also somehow manages to pace them, like, perfectly. And that's even with the 90s color-coded keycard thing in there, too. Even though your arsenal is basically completely filled out only two hours in or so, the levels always offer some new and interesting way for you to leverage those weapons. There are enemies in every possible direction at every possible range. Right in front of you, way over there, up on that thing, around that corner. And shaking that up really encourages you to reach for all of your weapons without implementing things like damage-type resistances, which remove that kind of decision-making from you. And not to mention the looks of these levels, too. God damn! I know the vintage 90s thing isn't exactly for everyone, but I think it really complements the tone that this culty, demony nightmare has. And it even has a nice range of colors while doing it. The enemies sound and act exactly like you'd expect the average Pennsylvania residents to. Very realistic there. The only issue of any real significance that I have with the game is that subsequent playthroughs basically offer you the same experience as the first. I suppose that's what Endless Mode and Multiplayer are for, though I haven't really been too drawn to either. Endless is fine, I guess, but it's basically exactly what you'd expect it to be, and not really much more. I'd also say the same thing for the industrial metal soundtrack, but I can't deny that there's some really catchy riffs in there, some nice ambient pieces too. This is another one of those games that basically sells you exactly what's on the box. If you're looking for an entry into the neo-boomer shooter world, this is a great place to start, especially when it's on sale for 8 bucks. About a week ago, I had this entire list written, and then I realized that Teardown technically came out of early access this year. You probably recognize this game for its very nice destruction sandbox, but what you might not know is that there's a campaign to this game that features all of your favorite activities. Problem solving, breaking and entering, burglary, vandalism, the whole gambit. Putting together, or I guess, I guess technically you're like deconstruct. Building a route and then racing against the clock is, dare I say it, an original gameplay loop that's actually never been done before? 
I mean, maybe there's some other game that's focused on trial and error robbery via overplanned speedruns, but I guarantee it doesn't play quite like this. It's crazy how most of the levels are just buildings and stuff, but with the fully destructible environment and a big toolkit, anything can be an obstacle or a solution. Working out your plan is like this crazy brainstorming session. You come up with a good idea, but you miscalculate, it doesn't work out, and then you come up with a completely brain-dead idea that could never possibly work, and it doesn't work, but you get a lot closer than you think. So you refine it, make a few tweaks, cut a few corners, and eventually, miraculously, sometimes it works. And it's amazing. I feel like a mad scientist throwing beakers together. Having a toolkit with limited ammunition is a really smart way of creating constraints without constricting on your creativity. But once you upgrade things, you can kind of go gung-ho, but that never feels like too much of an advantage since there's always some new problem to try to wrap your head around. One thing about Teardown I don't see people talk about enough is the lighting, and specifically the color, which is phenomenal. This is a really beautiful game. You want to know the difference between this and this? This is a game with ray-traced lighting. This is a game designed with ray-traced lighting. See how enabling ray-tracing completely changes the color in this scene? I mean, obviously this is a matter of taste, but I much prefer this to this, and you know what's even better than either of those? This. Teardown is filled with vibrant colors that are contrasted and balanced perfectly with the shades and shadows, and you don't even need a ray tracing capable GPU to run it. They built ray tracing into the software of this game, so while it may not be as intense or detailed as RTX or DXR, you can run it on basically whatever, and it looks good. Oh, and speaking of underrated parts of this game, the soundtrack is actually really good too. I appreciate the more reserved approach that's designed to enhance the game rather than pair directly with it. It can be hard to do while making the music still interesting, but it makes you feel much cooler than you actually are, especially when you're frantically trying to get to the escape van. It's super spacious too, which really adds to the overall ambience of every level. Teardown is pretty innovative and just intuitively fun. It's $20 at full price, $16 at lowest sale, and I easily recommend it at either price. It even has mod tools and workshop support. Actually, you know what? Fuck it, I'm gonna do it. This is a certified hood classic. Vampire Survivors is a dangerous game. It's the type of game that you can open, blink, and then suddenly realize two hours have passed. In fact, it's, it's very possible that that happened to me multiple times while writing this video. This game pounds your dopamine receptors like a speed bag, and it could certainly be manipulative with that if it wanted to, but miraculously, the Ponkel team have decided to take this very fertile ground for microtransactions and cosmetics and just sell you the whole thing for like five bucks. I mean, yeah, maybe two dollars for the DLC doesn't make as much sense proportionally, but we're still talking about a new level, new characters, new weapons, and more reasons to keep coming back. I've put in about 80 hours into this game so far. I have every achievement, I've unlocked every map, every weapon, every character. I had a rough earthquake a couple weeks ago that took out my power, and you want to know what I did until it came back on? I played on my phone, and the frame rate was about the same. It's amazing how easy it is to just unconsciously play this game. I mean, it can be engaging, very engaging, don't get me wrong, but you can also put it on another monitor while watching a video. You can listen to the soundtrack, which is quite good by the way, or you can put on a podcast and kind of go on autopilot. Now for me, there's not a lot of games that can offer that without being straight up boring, but this game is so finely concentrated that it can get away with it. It's like pure roguelike extract. If suburban moms found out about vampire survivors, they'd definitely turn it into an essential oil and try to cure their crow's feet with it. The art style and level design is, uh, inspired, but it does exactly what it needs to do and it looks good doing it. Well, I mean, it usually looks good doing it. Although I can actually forgive this to a degree in this game, because when your screen is nonstop filled with your own weapons, you probably don't have to see to know that you're winning. The weapon combo and evolution systems reward you for both thinking ahead and adapting to what you're given, and the skips, rolls, and banishes cleverly add another layer of control that you progressively unlock as well. After the game reached 1.0 back in October, I wasn't sure what the future of this game would look like, but I've been really impressed with both the quality and quantity of updates since then. New modes, new weapons, quality of life features, it's really nice to see the commitment to this game has not only paid off, but it hasn't changed with its success either. 
Vampire Survivors is easily one of the best deals on Steam right now, and it looks like the dev team are trying to keep it that way. The amount of productive hours this game is stealing from mankind may one day be our undoing, and that's what makes it a certified hood classic. I have no doubt that there is a future out there where we as a species will exist as mere flesh batteries for machines playing runs of this game for the next 10 millennia. The world will be but a wit- Did somebody say millennia? I already made a video jerking off this game, so I'll try not to rehash what I said there since basically all of it still holds up for me in the continuing 100 hours I've played since. But to be honest, I liked Dark Souls 3 so much that they could have literally just made Dark Souls 3.5 and I would have been fine with it, but despite Elden Ring sharing so much DNA with Dark Souls 3, it still feels quite distinct. I'm hoping that in future updates and potentially DLC we get some New Game Plus content. I mean, obviously I understand that the first playthrough is insanely long and it would be stupid to invest too much into people playing a second, but it would be nice just to have a little something. The New Game Plus surprises were some of my favorite parts of Dark Souls 2, even though a lot of them were just kind of copy and paste invaders. The story has never really been of particular interest to me in these games, but I like the way that it very gently directs you through opening the world up in Elden Ring. It makes it feel more natural when the stakes are raised later on, since you're progressively unearthing this massive, decrepit kingdom. I had a longer segment written here about how a lot of people started feeling burnt out after the capital, and I never really felt that, but I think the long and short of it really comes down to how much you enjoy the feel of the game's combat. For me, even in the most routine dungeon clear or herd of mob enemies, I still find fun in rolling around, hacking, slashing, and spelling. I did have issues with the game's co-op networking around launch, but they've died down over various updates and also with use of the seamless co-op mod. Beyond that, I really have nothing but nice things to say about Elden Ring, even Melania. I won't argue that she isn't really hard, she's easily the hardest boss in the game by a wide margin, but I think it's funny that her achievement stat on Steam is not far off from the other bosses at all. As dialed to 11 as she may be, Millennia's fight is just like every other boss. Learn the moves, find the openings, rinse and repeat. It's very doable. Oh, and before I forget, the soundtrack. Soulsborne has a long lineage of great soundtracks, and the ambient tracks in Elden Ring might be some of my favorite work to appear in these games, even though they're much more low-key than a lot of the boss music. The area designs in this game are this like kaleidoscope of colors, and the swells of music that you hear intermittently as you're exploring are really clever ways of stitching all these different places together while reinforcing their uniqueness. They aren't emotionally prescriptive either though. It really helps with this broader ambiguity that you kind of have to feel out as you're exploring the world. In summary, I think Elden Ring is a great game with a capacity to be one of the greatest games. I'm not sure that it's like a 10 out of 10 right at this very moment, but I think if both FromSoft and the community continue to give it the same care and attention that Dark Souls 3 got, it'll get there. Oh.